one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, was reclining next to him. Simon Peter motioned to this disciple and said, ask him which one he means. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Every Sunday when we come here to celebrate the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper, the Eucharist, we emphasize how the Supper symbolizes our unity, our union with Christ. These words probably sound familiar to you. Grant that we, being joined together in Jesus Christ, that we may attain to the unity of the faith. And as the, these, this grain has been gathered from many fields into one loaf, and these grapes from many hills into one cup, Grant, O oh Lord, that your whole church may soon be gathered from the ends of the earth into your kingdom. Every Sunday as we gather around the table, the supper nourishes that hope of our union with Christ. The union of the worldwide church with Christ. That Jesus holds it all together, all people, all nations, all tribes you know, the church. That's what we celebrate each and every week. And, and, and we seek to convey the comfort of that union, the comfort of Jesus' grace in the, well, the solemnity of that celebration. Right? Through our words and through our actions, through the music, in every way, the prayers, we try to convey our union with Christ as a great comfort. Take and eat, this is my body. Take and drink, this is my blood for the forgiveness of your sins. Every week we emphasize the comfort of belonging to Jesus Christ alone. And so it may be hard to imagine this morning that the original Last Supper was unruly and chaotic, tumultuous even, that before Jesus' disciples, the seed of the church, before they could even be launched out on mission, they were threatened with separation and division. I mean, it was unruly just because, to begin with, got off on the wrong foot, or the wrong feet, rather. Dirty feet, 12 pairs of dirty feet. And so, characteristic of the Son of God, who let go of the glory of heaven and was born among us in flesh and blood, Jesus removes his teacher's robe, his rabbi's robe, and he straps on the serving towel and bends down to wash 12 pairs of dirty feet until he gets to Peter who rises up in protest to this self-giving act of love. It's only after Jesus explains himself that Peter is able to settle down and allow his feet to be washed as well. But this is not the start. This is not how you start a quiet supper with close friends. It's a bit unruly. To emphasize the unruliness of it all, the text tells us that Jesus is troubled in spirit. These are the same words that John uses just a few chapters earlier to describe Jesus outside of his friend Lazarus's tomb. When Lazarus died, troubled in spirit. On that occasion, Jesus made his trouble public by, by weeping in front of everyone. And here, before his disciples, his trouble bubbles up and spills out over the meal when he says, one of you will betray me. One of you, my disciples, one of you, the twelve, one of you, my students, one of you, my followers, one of you, my 
dear friends, Jesus says. Think of those three years of being a friend, a disciple of Jesus. Hearing his teaching, witnessing his miracles, the bonds that form as people travel together on cold winter nights and hot sunny days and beautiful spring mornings when the sun rises on the blooming of new flowers. Think of, of suffering together through mutual hunger and celebrating together around the table at feast days. Think of the bond that forms when a group is under attack as Jesus and his disciples were constantly by the religious leaders. Think of the bond that forms when you are so frightened by a storm on the sea and then suddenly the joy and the comfort when it all goes calm. My friends. Jesus will call them his friends a little bit later on this same night. And so the disciples are bound to Jesus like, like rings on a tree by this fellowship and this love with Jesus and one another, they are friends. Will betray me. Betrayal of Judas. Betrayal means to break bonds of fellowship. It's exactly what it means. So here's Judas, one of the friends a, a, a splitting mall that crashes down on this supper, threatening to separate Jesus from his disciples and, and separate the disciples from one of one another. One of you will betray me. This original Last Supper was chaotic. And the splintering of the fellowship is, is experienced already by the disciples. It creates a stir around the table and we read that they stare at one another, startled, agitated even, perhaps casting accusatory glances at one another. It's not me. It must be you. Or is it you? Or who is it? At a loss, we read. Utter loss that a friend threatened to separate this fellowship. It's astonishing, troubling that one of them would threaten to separate this fledgling church, which I think makes it all the more miraculous, gracious, that it is one of them who offers hope. In the same way, the text tells us that one of them is the betrayer. We read that one of them is reclining next to Jesus. Let's take a close look at that one. Now, if you've been around the church, You've heard that this is a reference to the beloved disciple, as we read in the text. The scholars imagine that that is John himself. He's being humble. A little out of character for him. After all, he was the one elbowing for position on the left and right of Jesus. But let's say John has just finally grew up and he's humble by the time he writes his gospel. Maybe that's what he's doing. But John is always doing more. So I think John, in leaving a blank, is offering an invitation to us today. It's an invitation to you, to me, to be loved. 
John leaves the name out in order to make space for others at the table with Jesus. Space to experience his love. And that blank is also not just an invitation this morning. It is also a proclamation. It is a proclamation that even, even betrayal cannot separate from the love of Jesus Christ. <clears throat> Paul will say later, who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will affliction or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all these things, we are more than victorious through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So for our time of reflection, I invite you to think about that space at the table. By reflecting on Romans 1, and to aid in our reflection, I've removed all of the pronouns and replaced them with a space for your name. So as we close, spend some time leaning against Jesus because you are loved.